Hello, everyone. Great to see you. Um, it's been a fascinating day so far, uh, hopefully. Um, apparently, we're getting the party started. I heard that was our, that was our introduction. But um, what, I, what I would like us to do with this session is, is to kind of build on uh, some of the amazing insights that we've heard so far. Um, and really have, have, have more of a sort of future focus. So, you know, we've heard a lot about, you know, what's happening now, um, how Eightfold is being implemented, some of the impacts that it's having. And what I want to do with, with uh, the panelists and the sessions that we have is really, you know, kind of look forward and, and to, to kind of say, well, you know, how, how is this going to impact um, the world of talent in the years uh, ahead? So that's going to be the, the focus on that. And I think in doing that, um, you know, inevitably, we're going to be making some, some you know, forecasts and assumptions. So, so I'm going to invite my, my fellow guests here to you know, perhaps be slightly controversial, maybe even inflammatory. Um, and it'd be great to get some of your input as well. So we will have some time for uh, questions. Before we um, kind of dive into to the questions, as it were, can I just get Susie, uh, you to obviously Coca-Cola, people know who Coca-Cola is, but you, your role is digital employee experience and process design. Mm -hmm. Sounds amazing. What, what is it? <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so my um, role for Coca-Cola Europe Pacific Partners is to make sure that the tech that we have for our people um, helps them from when they're hired to when they retire. So for all of those key moments that matter, we have a great digital employee experience and that their everyday interactions are really simple and that the tools we have internally at CCP as, are as good as our employees experience outside in, the, in their personal life. So we've been on a journey for the last um, few years and, and it's, it's really exciting, even that my role exists. So we're not just saying broadly what's the employee experience, but specifically around digital, how can we make it as, as great as it needs to be to attract and retain our talent? Okay, fantastic. And Eden, obviously Ericsson, very large global technology communications business, but you know, VP, people analytics and digital solutions. Right. What's, what's the main thrust of, of, of what you do? Well, I think first I have a cool job, right? <laughs> so <laughs> from my perspective, um, you know, Ericsson's a cool company and right at the forefront of changing the way that we communicate through cellular technology and 5G and in the future 6G and and so my role looks after our global people analytics function so how we use the data that we hold on our employees to make better decisions take better fact-based decisions use empirical data and then also what we call digital solutions but really that means the simplification and digitization of the HR function so what are the uh, processes that we have what are the products and, and systems and vendors that we partner with in order to exactly what Susie's saying, right? Is the, you know, we, we need a Susie to help us to make sure we get the experience right when we implement technology. Otherwise, we end up implementing technology for technology's sake. So that's kind of where my role fits in. Okay, fantastic. Susie, you said something really interesting about uh, you know, building technology that, that gives you the same experience uh, as a consumer, as it were, mm -hmm. that we get in our personal lives. So, um, so Talent Partners, for those of you who don't know, we are a global talent insights business. We work with a network of employers all over the world, uh, as well as a very large network of uh, vendors, all of whom are helping employers to find and keep the people they need. So we get some great... Uh, insights into some of the trends and the innovations and also some of the challenges that uh, employers have. Um, but I want to just share a couple of kind of mega trends to, to, to kind of ground where we are today um, because, you know, all of we didn't end up here by accident. Um, I remember 1998 getting an email, getting into work, getting an email from Amazon saying uh, the new Radiohead um, album is out next week. Would you like to buy it? Um, and I thought, that's amazing. How did they know that? You know, and that was AI. You know, that was rudimentary AI. Now, that was 25 years ago. So... You know, this isn't new. This has been building for a long time. And as consumers, we are very comfortable with AI. You know, we use it without even thinking in our cars, in our homes, um, in, you know, in many ways in our everyday lives. You know, um, you know we, we're very used to AI. I think what is really happening is in the world of work, mm -hmm. suddenly uh, we think it's front and center. But you know what? It's not actually suddenly either. In 2019, the UK lost 
280,000 jobs from the high street in the previous 18 months. It's a huge amount of people, 280,000. We didn't really notice, and that was driven by technology. It was driven by our changing habits in, in shopping, uh, primarily, uh, that moved jobs from high streets to warehouses and, and, and you know, a fundamental shift in how we, uh, how we gauge. So, so the impact is already here. You know, it's not going to happen. It's already been happening. And I guess what we're discussing is, um, is it going to accelerate? And, and, and what, is, what does that mean? And then the, the final mega trend I would, I would talk about is, if you want to see the future, look at population pyramids. I uh, don't know if you've ever looked at those already. They show you the shape of populations globally. And globally, the population pyramid, male, female, old, young, it looks like that, right? In every developed economy, it looks like that, okay? Massive skill shortages, massive shortage of people at younger ages. Um, and again, I go back to the year 2000, read in The Economist, one of the biggest challenges of the 21st century will be economic migration. And that's essentially around the movement of talent for where, from where it is to where it needs to be, and compounded with the post-pandemic effect of um, distributed and remote working, it creates a huge opportunity, I think, for organizations to think about hiring for skills, and not just to, to think about it, but they have to, because hiring for experience just isn't an option anymore because the people aren't there. So, and that, I think, in many ways, is, is under, uh, underpins the, uh, the, the, the rise of organizations like Eightfold, because it's to meet that fundamental change in how the population is distributed around the world. Um, so, um, with, with that as, as some of the, the context to, to today, I want to um, have a couple of quotes to, to, to dive into uh, our, our questions. You know, Roy Amara was an American scientist and, and futurist. He was president of the Institute of the Future. There is such a thing. And his, his law is that we tend to underestimate the effect of technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. Um, now, Ashu Garg, uh, another technology luminary is taking a slightly different view you know, and saying that we'll see more change in the next five years than we will in the last 20. Now, technically, both of those could be true, but I think one is going to be more likely to be true than, than the other. So, Susie, can I turn to you? I mean, you use AI first tools in Coca-Cola to help you find and keep the people they need. So, which one of those statements do you think is is more true? Which one do you most agree with? Yeah, and I, I would agree with both, but I think the one that really resonates for me is, is from Eightfold's CEO, um, and not just because I'm in the room here, <laughs> but um, wh what we've seen is technology has, has been re really kind of behind where we wanted it to be. So uh, back in 2018, um, within the people and culture function, we did this whole process design. Um, we spent about a year designing hire to retire. So what should be the future way of working globally for our employees? So we d designed employee experience, employee journey maps. Um, we created um, this whole suite of, of processes. And from 2018, we were already able to implement a lot of those. So, um, things like onboarding, we had a fully digitized, mobile enabled process and, you know, happy days, we could crack on with that and we, we get great feedback on that process from our employees. But the talent processes, so talent acquisition, talent management, we sat and we waited and we waited and we spoke to so many different vendors about, can you meet this aspirational and process design? Can you meet this experience that we want to create for our employees. And the technology just did not exist. Um, so we piloted with Eightfold back in, in 2021, and, and we scaled up last year. And it finally feels like the, the technology is catching up to, to where we wanted it to be. So we're really on that journey now. And I just from hearing of some of the content today and, and seeing the Eightfold roadmap, I feel like it's just going to get quicker and quicker and quicker. So now we've started that and started to enable that digital talent management. 
Um, yeah, I think within the next five years, it's, it's going to be unrecognizable. And even those aspirational process designs that we spent so long waiting for the technology yeah. to catch up, we'll be like, oh, well, that's really basic, and, and we really need yeah, to yeah. revamp it and, and redo it. Can you be a bit more specific? So when you say the technology didn't exist, so, so what exactly was it you know, that, that was lacking? And then yeah. when did you know you, you had something that you could work with? Yeah, so I think the main thing was around matching the work at CCP with the workers and, and the skills, really. So how do, how do you give that visibility? And it's something we hear on our engagement survey. It's something we see in our exit interview. And I know a couple of other organizations have mentioned that as well, is what's my opportunity to grow and develop? And, and we just really struggle with visibility. And to, to now be able to show these are all of the internal jobs that are available and they're updating real time so anyone in the organization can see any of the roles but also if they want to just reskill within their role they're able to look at relevant learning look at project and gig opportunities so for, for us it was that kind of just visibility around how you can grow and develop that it just wasn't there. And I think with the AI uh, and certainly the, with the Eightfold tools, hmm. we've got that now. Okay. I'm gonna, I want to come back to, to, to the process about how you make that work effectively. Mm -hmm. But um, Eden, you know, turning to you, um, do you agree with Susie? Please say no. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I look, I think that until the beginning of this year, I probably believed the first statement. And that's as a technologist that's working in enterprise who's purchasing product and you're heavily reliant on a vendor and their roadmap, right? So any organization that's moving to software as a service needs to get in step with the vendors that it partners with. And I would say that there's a lot of uh, sales approach to what is available and then when, when the rubber hits the road, sometimes it's more difficult to land, right? So I think up until the beginning of this year, I would probably said, yeah, number one. But since the beginning of this year and, and chat GPT, let me just ask a question. Who hasn't tried chat GPT yet? Right, amazing. One, one, one person, half hand, right? I think. Yeah. So, so the acceleration <laughs> right, of AI is significantly changing now. And I think that the second statement now starts to ring true. It needs this pivot point from a technology perspective to shift the mindset of individuals. And if you've used it, which you will have, it's, it's, it's like magic, right? You, you, you type something, and then this magical response comes back. And that's very different to how we've seen our interactions with systems previously. Certainly systems have been able to do inference. They've been able to use language models, natural language processing. They've been able to connect statistically data sets together. They've been able to, to your point earlier, respond to your voice, Siri, Alexa, We've had satellite navigation for many years, right, which use some form of graphing database to choose your route. All of that is a machine learning and AI construct. But actually, now we're getting into something that simulates human behavior. And I think now, one, one of the, I guess, the things for me in the past few months is Facebook's investment in metaverse suddenly shifting, right? So, you know, a slowdown in that, and, a, and, a, and everybody's leaning into AI and uh, generative large language models. And so for me, I think that now we're at that pivot point where we will start to see a significant change. What needs to happen, eightfold, we've heard their roadmap today, but also other vendors that uh, we partner with, now, need, now the bar's been set. The bar's mm. been set on what uh, the expectation is of users now on AI. It's a bit like when we moved from dial-up connection in the mm -hmm. 90s to high-speed broadband well. internet, yeah. right? When organizations didn't have the same level of connectivity that you had in your house, and the consumer model was outpacing the enterprise model, that's when we had challenges. And I think we're in a position now where we might find the same. There's an yeah. expectation that's been set. And now we as an organization need to be able to respond to that. But just to, to pick you up on the point about you know, GPT being magic, I mean, it's also fantasy, some of it, <laughs> right? And, and that's, you know, that, that's, that's a, a hindrance because until people are comfortable that it's not fantasy, it, that's going to hold it back. I think there's an element of the models learning. There's certainly an element of control um, around uh, how, how the models respond to certain things and how it influences, right? So propaganda, you know, the, 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 what, we, what we've seen over many, many years in terms of how propaganda is used could be 
technically mm. used through, through that. But I think the interesting thing for me is that um, whether it replaces jobs or whether it is a tool to support roles is going to be where the key difference is. In the last week, I asked ChatGPT to write me a job description, and it did, and it did a really good job of doing mm. it. Right now, it's probably 90% of what I need. Yeah. What, my, my, you know, the input, what you ask it to do is really important, but actually the output is, is fabulous. So I think when we as workers figure out how to leverage those models and when organizations figure out how to make it safe so we're not pushing corporate data into the public domain, once that's solved, I think there's a real opportunity to leverage AI in many, many, many ways. Yeah, and I think that that phrase about it's 90% there. I think, you know, it's a bit like a bridge that only goes 90% of the way. It's not a bridge, but, but it gets you 90% of the way really quickly, but it still right. needs someone else, you know, a right. human to, to do that final, final bit, which I think is, it, it kind of answers the question to a point about, you know, it supports jobs rather than destroys jobs. Yeah. But um, right. we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. By the way, on ChatGPT, when it was first released, you could ask it, uh, ChatGPT, um, what's the best way of investing a thousand pounds in the stock market? Now, there is a huge uh, regulatory framework in this country that, that says you're not allowed to do that, you know, but for the first few weeks <laughs> until they'd figure, now they actually managed to shut that down quite yeah. quickly, so it does show that they can, they can regulate <laughs> at speed when they, uh, when they have to. Um, Susie, coming back to you um, about the, the, the kind of implementation and th this idea that, you know, the, the technology can move as fast as it moves, but organizations mm. don't move at the same speed. So, yeah. um, you know, internally finding people is still governed by human rules, though, right? No matter how good the technology is. Yeah. How do you overcome that? Yeah, definitely. But I think it's about kind of telling the story to the business and, and in fact, getting the business to tell the story to each other. So when we started our um, implementation of talent management, we started with a, a pilot in, in one function just to see how it landed and, and to try some different techniques to see what works, what doesn't work. And so when we've scaled up, we went live with a video that was people who were involved in the pilot who told their story about, this is how it helped me. And it was just one small thing. So it helped me find some learning that was relevant for me. It helped me to connect with someone else in the business who was working on a similar project, and we just shared ideas. And I think that really resonated because it didn't feel like this is a corporate tool that's being pushed by people and culture. It felt like this is a tool that actually, as a business, we've been asking for for a long time, and now it's here, and we're going to grow and develop it together. So that's also been a really key part of what we're doing is we've got a, a feedback um, button on the bottom of the home page and we say give us your feedback whether it's good or bad and it will help us to define what we do next and and we really want to hear from employees of actually what do you want to see more of and, and what's not adding any value for you so yes there's this whole skills piece uh, that's helpful for the organization but primarily and particularly for my role it's about the employee experience and is it a useful tool that you want to go back and use more mm. So, um, when we talk to, to employers, you know, we often say you can't fix attraction if you can't fix attrition. Um, and a, an element of that is you need to make it as easy to apply for a job internally as it is to apply externally. And a, a lot of employers go, oh yeah, well, well, we do that. And I'll say, well, do I need to ask anyone to get permission to apply for a job? Yeah, you need to ask your manager or HR. I said, well, you failed at the first fence because if I apply externally I don't need to do any of that I don't need to have been enrolled six months I can just go and apply so um, and that's what I mean about the, the, the sort of changing you know the hiring manager behavior mm -hmm. and I, I won't say who it was to protect the guilty but I had a lovely conversation over lunch uh, with someone from a big professional services firm and she said it's easier to leave and apply for a, jo a different job internally than it is to try and move <laughs> internally. I'm, yeah. I'm sure she was exaggerating a bit, but I suspect not by, not by much. So, you know, I don't know if you want to pick up on that. Uh, yeah, how, do you, how do you solve that kind of challenge? Because that, that gets in the way of, of really being able to optimize sure. the technology. I, th I think that's why we as organizations are investing in the products that we, that we are. We recognize exactly that. Almost everything about finding a job externally 
it requires some level of proactivity. The, the employee looks for a role or gets contacted by a recruiter or LinkedIn or a job board uh, messages them and, and internal systems have been a long way from competing with that. Uh, uh, you know, and I think part of the solving for this is technology. So the Eightfold product for us is great, right? We get the ability for people to log in, create a profile. We know that when uh, Eightfold in first skills, it does a much better job of asking people to tell us their skills. You know, by fi factors of five or six, we get way why, more. Why is that, more. do you think? I, think? I think when you ask somebody with a blank sheet of paper to write down what they're good mm. at, they write down the immediate things they can think about. And then if you're in a conversation with someone, like a career coach, and the coach says, yeah, but what about those things? Mm. You end up writing new things down. Mm. That's kind of what the AI is doing. It's saying, yeah. well, other people who do those roles also have these skills. So are they relevant? Click a plus or a minus. I mean, that's... That's a much simpler way than saying, no, no, think of more things. You need more than seven mm -hmm. skills. So leveraging technology to do that, I think, is important. Um, but there's a huge behavioral shift that's required. So uh, whether you're using the kind of improved internal career process or whether you've moved on to a project-based open talent market, the principles around how to operate as an organization need to be super clear. M managers that... Um, are losing talent to a marketplace, they're paying for talent that's working on other people's projects, causes friction, unless they're also uh, collaborating with the, with the open talent market and they're taking talent onto their projects. And I think if, if you get that uh, behavioral shift working, then it can they certainly help. But we can't underestimate the amount of ch change required in getting an organization to work differently. We can't even get it right to f have someone find an internal job mm. easily enough based on your examples, let alone come and work on a project with discretionary effort to learn these new skills to get a new job, right? Okay. Moving on to the, the types of jobs that we think are, are going to be um, you know, most impacted. I mean, again, when most of us thought about this initially, we, we kind of assumed it would be, you know, high process, you know, jobs with a high degree of, of, of process. But, you know, turns out that chat GPT can, you know, write a, a, a kind of fairly decent poem or a tune or, you know, what it, it can do things that are much more creative that we hadn't appreciated, which is very clever, but also quite unsettling because suddenly it opens up a much wider range of roles that, that could be impacted. Um, what's, your, what's your take on, you know, which roles are going to be most impacted over the next few years? You know, I'll start with you again. I, if that's I think all roles are going to be impacted, if I'm honest. Uh, we've seen examples of coders now, whether it's true or not, in the newspaper who are holding down multiple jobs because they get the... AI system to d do a lot of the code. That's mm. not, not too different to them looking on Stack Overflow to find the code, but it's instantaneous. You don't have to waste an hour trying to find the code and test it, right? So I think those are roles that we would never have thought might be impacted by AI. And I think we've got to move on from thinking about roles impacted by automation, which is a repetitive uh, process similar to the Industrial Revolution, where we're moving from one way of working to another way that's more efficient. We're going to move on from that level of automation into thinking how do we integrate large language generative AI models into how we do things. There's no point doing tasks that can be done through a, uh, an AI model if it's controlled properly, if we hmm. you know, audit them properly, etc. So I think uh, it, all roles will be impacted. I, I still think that there's a... Um, there's a possibility that many of the roles that exist today won't exist in the next 10 years. But whether that's through automation or just us generally move, moving on through the workplace in terms of the types of roles that we have. Any I'm sense of which you think are, are you know, in, in your world, it, which are most... Anything to do risk. with repetitive task or anything that requires um, uh, reading of information, duplicating of information, anything like that I think will be done. Uh, through uh, AI models, image recognition, uh, natural language processing, anything like that, I think in the future will just become standard. Susie, your take? I mean, to, to me, it's a really exciting time because for so many people, there are elements of their role that are just really dull, repetitive, scheduling meetings, reading emails, and actually, if some of that could be done automatically or taken away, to leave me to focus on the cool bits of my job that I really enjoy, then that's going to be more engaging for everyone, right? So I feel like this is the beginning of a new way of working that's going to 
free up our time. You know, we talk about maybe moving to four-day weeks, and there's all of these opportunities that I think will come, and we'll probably look back at this time now and say, I can't believe we used to spend so many hours doing these mundane tasks that we didn't really care about or that didn't really add value. So it's really exciting, and I think the other exciting thing for the future is just more support and guidance and, and possibilities. So I remember always being asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And there, there was no guidance. It was just, you know, pick a, a job from the world. But now it's like, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, these are the interests you have. These are, therefore, the skills that you have. So here's some direction and maybe some things to pick from. And it also feels like, well, maybe you could try something for six months or a year and then switch to something else because your skills are transferable. It doesn't feel like you've got this job for life like my parents had. Mm. It, it's more flexibility, more excitement. And I think our attention spans these days are so short and you know we get bored so quickly that actually this is the way it's going to go. More, more excitement, more in it for us. So we're kind of the customers of our own careers. Yeah, yeah. Super exciting time. We're very lucky to be working now, I think. For younger people coming into the world of work for the first time, um, they don't have any skills, really, or, or they don't know what they're good at. You know? So how do you, how do, how do you get them to, to uh, um, explore or engage around figuring out what, what they want to do. Because, I mean, you know, it's a painful process, and I, you know, I see my own kids go through it, um, you know, finding out what they, you know, want to do in the world, and it's a process of, of, of trial and error, and, mm. you know, they'll end up doing something that they never thought about. Um, do you think channeling them too early is, is potentially not the best thing to do? That's quite a deep philosophical question, but... I mean, I, I think, like, I've got two daughters, one's three and, and one's ten. I mean, my three-year-old, she knows what she likes, she knows what she doesn't like. She can always use, already use Alexa to put on her favourite song. She doesn't know the name of it, mm. but she just says to Alexa, we'll play this, and, you know, so she's already fully better digitally skilled probably than I am. Um, yeah, she, she really knows her mind and what she likes and, and what she doesn't like. So, actually, if there was some sort of AI solution that could guide her through simply by asking her some questions, then I think she'd get some great results. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not worried about that at all. And I think it's more about what questions do we need to start asking and mm. answering rather than having to know all of these career paths. Yeah, yeah. We've absolutely piled through this so oh, fast. Wow. I can't believe it. Yeah. We've got five, so we've got some time for questions. Um, so I'm going to come to you uh, for any questions in a second. Um, but... Eden, just, did, do you have a, a take on that last The only thing I would add, because I think that's a great answer, the only thing I would add is that, back to that point two, right, of your opening statement, the acceleration over the next few years, we'll start to see the impact. And now I think AI models are able to write almost as good as a human, and that will start to impact marketing and communications and all kinds of things. In a couple of years' time, it'll probably be writing better than an expert, and, and that's going to change things significantly. One thing that I did, and if you haven't done this yet, uh, give it a try. I put some content, I, I removed anything confidential from it, but I put some content into ChatGPT and asked ChatGPT to rewrite it that a 16-year-old could understand it. And it simplified mm. the language significantly. And I think in a business environment, we tend to use so many business words now that actually when we're trying to get over communication, particularly in the, the experience space, what we want to be is really clear on what we want people to do. And the other thing you can do is ask it to pull out your key points from the text. Yeah. And it does a really good job of yeah, that. Yeah, I've used it for that. So right. it's fantastic. Mm. So I've got one final question for you in a couple of minutes. I'm going to ask, see if we've got some questions first. But I'll give you fair warning. Um, uh, a prediction. In five years' time, what will be fundamentally different? And I've got a kind of subset of that, which is what new roles do you think might exist that don't exist at the moment? So while you cogitate mm. that, any, any questions or, or observations from... One down here. I just wanted to know about, at that more senior executive level, if you've had any resistance, because it is quite a change for them as well, and getting their teams to understand, at that leadership level, as you mentioned, about allowing people to, you know, develop and learn new skills and, and re-skill and move into different areas, and a lot of the time, I think, at that more senior level, you get that resistance and the protective nature of talent. Mm. I just wondered how you, in your businesses, have approached that challenge. 
I mean, for us, I think our annual engagement survey results have really helped because growth and development always comes up as an area where we could do better and we get a lot of verbatim feedback on it. So um, all of the business leaders are trying to improve the results for their area so they know that that's something that they can tangibly improve. So I think that's really helped them to embrace it. And we haven't really seen resistance at that senior level. We've seen a lot of people embrace it. I would say probably the one challenge is around data privacy. Sometimes they feel like, should people be sharing all of this information? But as soon as you say, well, they put all of it on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. that's available to the world. Yeah. So why not share it with your colleagues? Yeah, yeah I, would, I would just agree with that. I think we, we very open at the top of the house now, including KPIs on the executive scorecard around moving internal talent and making sure that we're developing future skills so we're not stuck in a fulfillment strategy that is just buy from the market. We want a longer term view around that. So I certainly at uh, Ericsson, it's, it's shifting. I mean, I would say for companies like Ericsson and Coca-Cola, they, they, they tend to have very forward thinking leadership teams. The experience we have with a lot of our employers is the C-suite get it, but senior middle management that's yeah, yes, a kind of, that kind of larger vision. yeah, and they, they've got, they've got. So you know, we're quite a big organisation ourselves, but you want to see that kind of more junior leader yeah. embrace it as well, and not just think about their own impact. Yeah, but when you've got a 12-month target and a, a budget to hit this year, and you're looking at losing a key person, it's 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 tough, you know. Yeah. Any final questions before I go back to? No, nope. good. Okay, so the future. What does it look like? What new roles will, will exist and, and, and what, what will be fundamentally different in, in five years? Susie, I'm going to pick on you first. I, I think what will be different is skills and giving people time to develop um, will just be part of what organisations do. It will no longer be this sidebar thing that happens once a year. I think talent growth development will be happening all the time, will be available through mobile apps, just, you know super responsive and I think the, the new roles will be similar to what me and my team do so really measuring experience um, yeah and making sure we're delivering the right experiences for employees to support them I, I can see really that kind of role growing where it's at the moment is is very niche okay thank you Eden I think It'll largely depend on organizations like Microsoft where how they embed this type of technology because that has the power to revolutionize all jobs, uh, particularly the integration of Microsoft Teams if you're a Microsoft shop and how that channel is used to either do experience or show opportunity or allow people to enter skills and all kinds of opportunities there. And their investment in AI, I think, will be significant in how that changes. So I think that most jobs will change uh, as the technology changes, but I do see a, a shift in the way we govern this type of technology mm, in the future. Yeah, yeah. And I think that whilst we have uh, information security and data privacy teams today, I think the AI element of that is going to be very different because it's unlike anything we've seen before. So I think there'll be an industry that starts up around, around that. If I was advising my daughter on what to do now, I would mm. say you need to start to think about that. But I would also say don't rely on AI because you yeah. lack the skills, critical thinking, uh, anything like that, that that means that you try to find out the answer. Don't rely on an AI solution. Absolutely. Listen, there, there was so much more we could talk about, but we're, we're out of time. You know, I think the, the talent agenda has always been uh, important for organizations. Um, I think arguably it's never been more important. Um, and, and actually, I think it is the most important uh, issue that, that organizations face. So it's been fantastic being able to Thank share you. the panel with you. Thank you so much for your, your insights. Great. Thank you.